What's that? No, I think maybe it might be a little bit long, but uh, we uh, Uh, hi everybody. Uh, just just to welcome again Flo Florian and, and Ying, and uh, also just to sort of uh, reflect a little bit. Um, you st started your studio uh, Solid Objectives in 2008, so it's just two years. Um, and if you look at your uh, website, you describe yourselves as, as kind of like ideas, you know, interested in ideas, which since we are a university, that should more or less work. Um, but I think it's sort of interesting to sort of, as it were, take the measure of, a, of an office after just two years. Like it's a very, very short time, given that uh, even the shortest of projects in architecture is generally longer than two years. So actually, it's sort of impossible to be doing the lecture. Um, and I'm interested in that sort of, the, the way in which this lecture is sort of premature, and, 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 and yet on the other hand, of course, you both have very long uh, histories and, and a lot of experience, and so actually you are re yourselves responsible for many completed buildings of the highest quality, but then you started this new venture which puts you back, in so in a way you, you, you have this very interesting situation of having been involved in some of the most beautiful and accomplished buildings in the world, and now you find yourself like re re rebooting and even that's official, like so for example in 2010, just passed, um, you, you guys did the PS1 Young Architects program with the pole dance and so on, so you're officially Young Architects, right? And, 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 if, and just in case nobody uh, understood the point, then you win the AIA New York Young Practices Award. So you're not only a young practice, but you're officially a young practice, but also an award-winning young practice, which means you're, uh, you could get the award because you're like younger than the other young practices, like you're the really young ones. And there's a bit of a risk here because it sort of suggests that maybe young practices have ideas and uh, old practices have uh, reality, right? And so if you become real, you stop talking about ideas. And I think it's certainly interesting that some of the architects that interest us a lot who, who continue to be successful continue to be ideas people, even though officially they could give up with ideas and start talking about contracts. Um, so my little point here is that it's not so simple really um, if officially, if you look at the kind of projects you're doing, they, they involve exactly the kind of experimental zones so characteristic, uh, not only of young architects, but I would say of the youth of the field itself, like pavilions, ex installations, exhibitions, magazine, teaching, all of these laboratory uh, uh, conditions, which inc incubate the most interesting thoughts and sometimes uh, produce buildings and sometimes don't, but remain in a way the threshold in which arch the architectural discipline mainly operates. Or to say it another way around, even, even if you did a great building, if any architect did a great building, if it didn't resonate in that space of magazines, publications, exhibitions, and so on, it actually would have no value. So it's not only the place in which we incubate ideas that can't be built, but even if we do build, they have to come back into that zone. So I think actually the so-called young architects become very interesting because they are the caretakers of a, of a zone of the discourse. And just to show how I think it's not so simple, you guys did the house for uh, Ivan and Jane Chermayev, and that seems seem to me a super interesting commission. So this means the so-called super young office uh, does this uh, commission for a person who's not so young, actually is precisely not young, but is a very, very experienced and famous designer and is the son of one of the great architectural, you know, uh, Chimir, one of the great uh, designers and, and uh, uh, thinkers. So somehow the youth thing and the, and the age thing all sort of uh, come together. And I noticed in the interview you did with with Chumayev, he says this beautiful thing that it, you know his father's a great architect, but um, he didn't want to be an architect because it takes it takes so long to do things. Right? It takes forever, so he became more like a graphic uh, uh, designer. But th there you find yourself, and then you're in the office uh, of Sajima with Sam Chumayev. So, so, th so basically, the so-called youth thing, uh, I, I'm I'm not a believer in it. I mean, actually, you're not young. Uh, in almost any other field, you should be retiring. Um, Right, and if, so, so I just, you know, just saying that, like, so yes, again, you know, young, yes, young office, but actually, young, it takes architects a long time to learn how to be young, it would seem, um, and and the best architects, once they've mastered the art of being young, uh, they do uh, uh, really well. So I think the way the way things operate in architecture, it's not like you're young and then you get old. You're actually old. Then you go to architecture school and we teach you how to be young, and then you try to perfect the art of being young. 
And so I sort of see you guys right at the epicenter of our field. Anyway, it's a big responsibility. Uh, but they are also two of the nicest people uh, in the universe and absolutely fabulous teachers. So we're really, really lucky that you're teaching with us. So welcome back. Maybe it's more midlife crisis. Uh, <laughs> second view. Uh, um, thank you. I, I, you were going to start, right? Jean. Yes. Yes. Can we turn off some lights? Please. Let me see where. Oh, we do that, right? Why don't you do that? Where, and do again? <laughs> where do we turn off the light again? Is it, or do I? Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, um, Marcus, for that um, introduction. I just want to confirm the point that um, I think we're actually very young. And <laughs> uh, not just the age thing, but also as the age of the office. Because the, um, for me, I think that the office is not just about um, Florian and I, you know, the owner of the, or the, um, the name of the office, but uh, it's also kind of this uh, network of people and uh, the, um, the dynamic and the connection that the office has to build together. And uh, indeed, the identity of um, Solid Objective Seidenberg Leo Soil Office was started two and a half years ago. And uh, the only reason um, I think uh, we are here tonight um, owes largely to a moderate group of people who had been uh, working with us and uh, a great supporter of our ideas and uh, have given us, some people have given, given us chance to work with this thing called architecture. And uh, I think to build up this um, group of people, um, it takes a lifelong um, commitment. And uh, we are only second year into that. So um, we are a very young office. <laughs> and uh, um, so the, sediments, uh, the sedimentations accumulated throughout this two and a half years, um, which we abstract tonight in the form of lecture in a way um, attempt to tell a cohesive story, but uh, we're probably the first one to admit that it's our own story or our own version of Florian, I, my own version of the story. So, um, but nevertheless, we try. Um, the title you see here, To Be Determined, um, loosely ties together the six projects that we're going to present tonight uh, with a theme that's twofold. The first, um, first fold, um, it refers to the social and the natural construction of this uh, world that we live in, um, which can be said to be, um, it's something to be experienced as something um, irrational, um, uh, indeterminate, multi-layered, and the constant influx, influx, and sometimes even volatile. Um, it is not possible to escape um, the way in which that um, the feelings of um, <coughs> fantasies and uh, um, and anxieties and prejudice, prejudice and fears, and all these uh, other um, uh, um, unstable feelings that woven their way into these times that we're living. Um, so, and secondly, supposedly that we can free ourselves from this fascination to the stable, the monument, and uh, the explicit, we can start to maybe grasp the, this elastic environment that we're living. And uh, we, in a way, we're very doubtful of um, the fast-tracking modernity that we all learn in the school. Um, can offer us a resolution, and we contemplate and wonder um, if everything is elastic, maybe we should just float in this um, mist of unstable um, but determined, uh, determined intentions. So um, one of the first practical concerns of this new ecology that um, I referred to is you know, our own relationship with the surroundings, our um, surroundings. And uh, um, I think with modernity, it granted us with the law of nature, which we found a stable structure and a uniformity. However, increasingly in the recent history, we have come to understand that this uniformity derives from the projection of our own desires, which um, is to a large extent um, have become richer and more device, uh, diverse. diverse. Um, we are subject, uh, we're subjects that's responsible for the construction of this grid of structure 
that has become very unstable and uh, um, sometimes we stand on the stilts that are barely touching the ground beneath us. So with this kind of thoughts, we entered a competition for um, the PS1 and MoMA um, Young Architects program of 2010. And MoMA is a very modern institution and uh, um, with its association comes with the Bauhaus tradition. This is the um, Oscar, Sch uh, um, this is Oscar Schlemmer's um, choreography piece called Pole Dance, which we um, wanted to pay tribute um, to in our proposal to this uh, competition, but also we attempt to destabilize it um, um, in our proposal. So in the courtyard of PS1, we um, laid out 80 fiberglass poles um, on an elastic grid that's um, constructed by bungee cords. And within this environment, we um, inserted activators such as hammocks and uh, um, ladders and uh, um, misters. And then these poles are connected to the ground with only the pin connection, allowing them to be um, dynamically moving within the system. Um, so, and with this um, <coughs> various activators, as we call it, um, the wind, the, um, the pressure of the water, and the people playing, that um, the system becomes um, something that um, the subject engages with. And with this um, structure, we um, hoped that, that the people would re-engage with the physical world and uh, find a playfulness within um, um, their interaction. And yeah, another important thing was really mm -hmm. the uh, desire to create an interior, so very much uh, a space that you enter uh, rather than uh, an object. So uh, the sensorial, um, the spatial, um, rather than the, 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 the form-driven uh, uh, architectural project is something that we were trying to uh, experiment with uh, here. Um, so another um, component of this project is that within, um, in the small courtyard uh, next to the big main space, um, as the as the environment of the immersive and interactive um, in part of the installation, which um, the eight poles in this small courtyard are um, have the accelerometer, which is oh have the accelerometers, which is this uh, devices that detects the emotions of um, objects, and uh, they have this accelerometers embedded in them um, that. Um, also a sound engineer um, programmed uh, application that would uh, trans transform um, the data of the motion that's detected into a tone, um, tone uh, music or tone sound that will be, uh, can be played in the space to the speakers. And so, and also some app um, application designers um, have gathered this data and uh, put them um, into an iPhone application that um, each pose can be claimed on, on your uh, mobile phones. And uh, through clicking through them, you can manipulate the effect of the each of these poles, um, the sound they make, and uh, together. There's a play button. There's actually a play button. So um, <laughs> the idea is that it, everyone who um, can get on this application would be able to claim a poll virtually and uh, um, ch uh, change the, the volume of the poll and you can also um, shake it and then manipulate the sound of the poll. Now with this uh, application, we um, attempted to basically realign the <coughs> physical and the virtual and maybe um, with this combination to um, to um, see if uh, there's any kind of sim similarities within these two orders, or maybe they are one of the same thing. The the idea, indeed, to 
I, and I think, in a way, PS1 asked us to also react to this uh, um, uh, uh, um, big question of sustainability, but everybody, uh, every architectural project now needs to uh, an <coughs> answer to. And so our thinking was also um, maybe uh, the, if we can find a way that people get more, uh, um, uh, there's a stronger uh, sensibility towards the physical, or, or what has happened, what has happened in, uh, with our relation to the physical, uh, is there a way that we can come up with a device that reconnects us to the physical um, as everybody has escaped, say, in the virtual space? And so by actually um, using the, the playfulness of the virtual and seeing if we could reinstill that into the physical, uh, we, we wanted to um, yeah, basically bring people's attention back to the, to the physical environment. But by providing a, a hybrid, so a hybrid of a virtual and a, and a, a physical, um, you know, we try to merge these two environments. So this is, for instance, a, a, a Flickr page where people could directly with their iPhone upload uh, pictures that they would take in the, uh, in the space. And what we just passed, I think, before, was uh, th this is, for instance, you can make drawings with these poles as well. So. Um, these are uh, sound-generated uh, drawings um, that uh, come from these poles uh, with these uh, accelerometers in them. And so there's drawing uh, contests that could be uploaded onto this uh, website uh, that we um, uh, had organized uh, here together with uh, Two by Four, uh, the graphic designer, and um, Arab uh, as sound uh, engineers on this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's one of the. Um, the other point that's worth noting is that um, to our uh, great um, pleas that this um, installation has become an open platform to which that uh, many um, collaborators um, kind of came to us and proposed it to integrate their own project into it. And uh, so Arab with the sound, um, the sound engineers from Arab and uh, the application developers from 2x4 and also the national champion of pole dancers um, came to us and wanted to do their own projects in there. And I think that um, um, it, was, uh, uh, it was surprising that a very um, good result that, you know, precisely it was not a um, project only of our, um, our project, but also a project from, uh, uh, with the open platform. And this video I'm going to show you now um, is also came also out of um, a voluntary collaborator who came to us and uh, wanted to do a 3D. <laughs>
next uh, project. So apart from uh, doing, uh, uh, um, trying to enter young uh, architects uh, 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 competitions, we uh, do other competitions. Uh, but this is actually a young architects competition as well. This was um, in Athens, uh, Greece, uh, a competition um, um, called Up to 35. So we could still um, join uh, that. Uh, for a young uh, developer uh, who was also under 35, um, who had this ambition or has this ambition uh, for an area uh, in downtown uh, Athens, uh, Greece, to through student housing, uh, basically regenerate uh, this neighborhood. This neighborhood is um, um, it's called uh, Maratones uh, and Keramikos. Uh, uh, it's two streets uh, that define uh, this area, and this shows um, the site. Uh, of the of the competition, actually the exact uh, site uh, of, of this um, of this um, uh, um, entry uh, was here. It was an open competition. Uh, about I think 250 people uh, entered, um, and uh, we entered um, as well. What um, uh, the, the, the neighborhood is is um, indeed a neighborhood in transition. It is uh, a, a working class uh, neighborhood, uh, very dense uh, on the ground. Very um, sort of uh, typical lo uh, loud uh, uh, streets, and then um, uh, yards in the back uh, that are not really uh, necessarily uh, used, and um, somewhere there's sort of a big uh, uh, disconnect between uh, what is happening in the in the street and what is happening in the back. And through a um, simple um, operation and something that um, was possible within the uh, local code, we actually shifted the bulk of the um, uh, the mass on the site and created um, uh, an opportunity to, to make a new uh, typology, uh, if you would like, uh, especially this being um, a, a typology for young, for the young, um, for, for uh, college uh, students. It's, it's a time in your life when you're still willing to rethink uh, maybe how to live, uh, how to live in the city, how to live with uh, one another. And by uh, this, smart, this small sort of uh, and simple um, uh, shift, you also create a sort of equality for all the uh, units uh, that happen in there. So it's a very democratic uh, move, which seems uh, quite appropriate for the location of the, of the competition. Um, the, the, what it also does is it really opens up the street uh, um, into the yard. So it, opens, it, it sort of opens up the block and, and brings the public in. And it allows uh, um, yeah, basically this, this zone to become a buffer between the, 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 the units and the, and the street uh, itself. It does give you obviously a very um, uh, uh, narrow and slim uh, uh, section of a building, four and a half uh, meter of building and four and a half meter of, uh, of, of yard. And um, so we, we designed it uh, very, very uh, precise, almost like a, like a, a Japanese uh, capsule uh, hotel. Um, we did want to give all the students their private uh, unit, not some sort of large uh, uh, collective uh, <coughs> dorm style uh, living. Everybody had their own uh, unit, but we, we organized it sort of in zones from super uh, um, uh, um, uh, personal and uh, uh, closed gradually to more open and more public. And I think uh, this, the age for which this um, uh, uh, typology in building is is exactly uh, uh, probably you guys, but it's sort of it's where you jump from sort of very intimate and and concentrated uh, modes to very uh, open and exuberant, and, and so this we we try to pack uh, these different modes in, into a very uh, small and confined uh, section. So here you see almost like a Frankfurter Kuchen style uh, efficiency in the in the uh, room where you study, you cook, and you s and you sleep, and then um, this view out to this yard. This yard is actually a, a vertical uh, yard. So you see all these uh, um, lives uh, uh, sort of happening um, uh, within, the, within this elevation. We, we varied uh, the, the, the section uh, to, to uh, generate some variety also in the, in the spaces. Ultimately, um, 16 or, um, uh, well, there was a puzzle to try to get in as many units uh, as possible between uh, 16 and 18. Um, and the shared uh, um, uh, terraces as a way to move up uh, in the building. Um, getting to your room means also uh, passing somebody uh, in front of their uh, window, so a, a way to stimulate um, social exchange uh, as well. And this the yard um, that can be occupied by um, uh, students and, and the, in a way, very uh, clean and simple and abstract uh, facade as um, uh, within this chaotic neighborhood. Um, 
part of the competition uh, was not only to come up with an answer for one type, but actually look at the neighborhood as a whole and think of this as a, a sort of a viral uh, typology that could start taking over the entire neighborhood. And so uh, we um, were actually one of the finalists. We didn't win the competition, but we were with the, uh, the last uh, five and we could uh, further develop a scheme. And especially our, um, this, this sort of strategy of opening up the block and gradually through this um, intervention, if you would do this on all sites, the, the whole urban fabric would actually start to change and, and rather than having this hard uh, uh, division between um, uh, uh, street and inner court, you get a much more porous and um, 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 uh, yeah, diffused uh, um, urban fabric. So this was um, our um, argument also for, uh, as a strategy to take over this entire uh, uh, block. Uh, what was interesting, so that we um, indeed did not, uh, we weren't selected for the final project, but the next day, indeed, the, uh, this young uh, developer called us and said, we like the, the strategy, and this strategy works very well on other lots uh, that we have. So the next day, uh, we started to work on a much larger uh, lot on the other side of the street, uh, right uh, here. And that is something that is in development uh, uh, now, obviously, also, um, uh, apart from the uh, US, uh, Greece is also suffering somewhat from uh, 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 financial constraints. So at this moment we are, um, well, I, I will show you where we, where we are. What was interesting here, so this is the other side of the street. This is literally sort of facing uh, the site uh, where we did the competition. This, this site is much deeper uh, actually, and it also allowed us to think of um, a more uh, variety in typology. Uh, there was sort of a shift towards young uh, families. Um, the desire for a, a coffee shop and a, and a cafe. So the idea actually that these uh, different buildings as he takes over the neighborhood have different amenities that can be shared between all the uh, uh, units. Uh, the complication here was also that we had to in include three stories of, of parking. So this became actually a very intricate uh, puzzle um, with ultimately how many units? Like, Yanis, um, how many units did we have? Janis and Elias from our office are also here. They worked very hard on this uh, uh, project. I think we ended up with uh, about around 50 uh, uh, units. Um, this uh, project uh, at this moment is developed up to uh, schematic design, uh, but we actually continue to sort of uh, uh, push it, not just uh, um, to um, sort of keep it alive, but also because it, um, it is an exploration for us of how you can think about the city. So this is an exhibition we had um, in Beijing at Studio X uh, there where we actually assumed that we had taken over the entire neighborhood with this, uh, with this typology and sort of see how it, uh, yeah, how it, uh, how it would develop. Um, third project um, which um, uh, is, uh, keeps us in Asia um, is something uh, we're working on uh, right now um, in Seoul. This is uh, downtown uh, Seoul, or basically the north. It used to be the old uh, town. It's um, a view from a mountain towards the castle, the main uh, castle. I don't know if I'm sure there's people here from Seoul and they probably recognize it. This uh, is, I think this, uh, it's called Son Juk Don, uh, the place. Maybe somebody can correct me in the room if they know it better, but it's basically the old uh, uh, downtown area where there's a lot of old uh, courtyard uh, homes. And, um, we, uh, the, the, sort of the idea behind this project is driven by two uh, things. One is sort of very local and specific and the other um, came, and, and this is maybe more our sort of internal uh, uh, idea and, and research uh, or, or sort of discussion that we have um, within the office, but as um, uh, Mark said, we are here to speak about ideas as well, not just about uh, solutions. Um, at some point, uh, a student presented her work and she said, well, uh, you know, this can be sort of kind of, uh, well, whatever. And I we initially thought it was quite uh, a lame sort of description of her project, but then realized that maybe everything these days can be sort of kind of whatever, because in the past, maybe we made buildings to do something, but at this moment, we're doing a lot of these stuff uh, online or in the virtual realm. So almost everything we make can maybe be sort of kind of whatever, and so we, started to think, how, what does that look like if you actually have to design that? Uh, and so we got um, interested in thinking about a, a sort of a deliberate uh, ambivalence and um, um, th this idea of something that is 
uh, ambivalence or something you can't uh, grasp actually becomes maybe more uh, desirable rather than something that is very uh, explicit and very uh, um, easy to understand. So somewhere the mystique of something that you can't uh, uh, grasp, something that is that has this um, uh, undefined uh, or uh, uh, undetermined uh, quality uh, is maybe something that we can uh, um, uh, desire. Uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, this is not something we shared uh, with our client. Our client is uh, Ms. Lee. Uh, she uh, has a gallery, uh, a large gallery, Kukche gallery in, uh, in this neighborhood. And you see on the left side, and sort of the original uh, 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 um, courtyard style uh, homes. And in the back, you see the evil gallery sort of uh, you know, moving into this neighborhood. Um, Ms. Lee has been quite successful in doing that. This um, it are her first uh, two buildings, uh, the Kukche Gallery uh, One, which she started about, I think, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And her second building, um, uh, Kukche Two. Um, so those two were uh, built. And when they came to us, they uh, had sort of infiltrated in this neighborhood. You see here these old sort of uh, holdouts of other uh, uh, homes. But this neighborhood is becoming, becoming very popular. It's a very nice uh, um, a walkable area where uh, um, you know people uh, come in weekends, uh, young couples to eat their puffy cream and other uh, 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 drink uh, fancy coffees. Um, we, so we were asked to look at the third um, building over uh, which is here, the first to exist. And at this moment, actually, um, our, our work on this is, is expanding to redesign uh, the first building and the second building. We're making uh, uh, adjustments there. Uh, but uh, initially, uh, um, we were asked to only think about this third building, and we're working also on this fourth building now. So this is sort of, um, um, it maybe in a way, relates to Greece in the sense that it becomes sort of a porous, semi-public uh, piece of, of city. Um, um, well, let's let's talk about this uh, uh, third building. So, the idea of this hard, uh, um, simple white box moving into this uh, uh, dense and fluid and historic fabric, um, we uh, uh, well, it, it's one of the uh, multiple galleries, and so uh, Seoul is getting a little bit nervous about these larger boxes moving moving in. Uh, but still, the requirements, especially this one, they wanted li a large project space. Uh, 15 meters by um, uh, 10 meters, uh, seven meters high, one big space in which they can have large uh, installations. So we, we provided them with the box and we um, very in a very straightforward diagrammatic way pushed out the uh, circulation uh, and the entrances. So you keep the pure, um, say, uh, minimalist white uh, box and very simple uh, entrance uh, elevator, corridor downstairs uh, and uh, stair up uh, are pushed uh, out. There's a large basement. There is a, a lecture hall uh, downstairs um, where uh, they will have presentations for their uh, collectors and uh, uh, a second basement with uh, storage and, and, and parking. So uh, that was the, that's pretty much the, the scope. The, here, the uh, uh, simple white uh, uh, art space with the skylights all uh, around. Daylight is important. Um, and then we had to think: How do we how do we bring this um, white box into the into this uh, urban fabric? And so this idea of uh, say deliberate uh, ambiguity and the idea of uh, making something that is uh, that maybe uh, because of its fact it, the fact that it is not a, a hard uh, edge but actually a sort of a, a softer and a diffuser um, uh, object, uh, maybe that could uh, be sort of a negotiator between this uh, uh, historic. Uh, uh, fabric and, the, and the, uh, the hard edge. This is a painting actually of the site, um, uh, old Korean painting, it's true. Um, this is the uh, site. Um, there is actually a, a, a river um, that uh, is where the, where the building is now, and we're actually feeding it uh, while building our foundations. So there's a lot of water uh, in the ground. Uh, this is a, so within, um, say, traditional Korean uh, um, you know, uh, painting, there is also this idea, idea of, of uh, a layeredness, a diffuseness, a fogginess. And actually then we found one um, uh, contemporary photographer that they represented also has the same sort of, um, say, uh, a cloud-like uh, uh, quality to their, um, to their work. And um, we thought, what if we have, we take this diagram and, and we actually sort of shrink wrap it in, um, in a layer of, of diffusion in a way. And it sounded all um, great and we made a, 
model and, and it's, we indeed literally uh, sh shrink wrapped um, uh, this diagram into this uh, uh, reflective um, sort of armor. And um, we presented it and uh, Ms. Lee said, that's great, uh, make it. Uh, we first had to get some approval from the historic uh, committee. So we, um, this is the, the file uh, we had, especially this diagram I think is quite um, strong in showing how well it fits um, <laughs> within the neighborhood. And so we got an approval. Uh, then the question is of course, um, great, but what is it? Um, and we had to think, especially because this is a double curvature, it's, it's complex, but at the same time it needs to be exterior, what, uh, so it needs to be strong. So what is uh, strong, which, you know, what is durable outside um, and can take on a double curvature? Um, the uh, chain mail uh, mesh is, um, it's a very simple uh, uh, thing used, uh, well, for people that uh, loved the past, uh, it's also used, or loved the past, it's also used for uh, belly dancing uh, uh, attire and for butcher uh, gloves. Uh, and it's only made actually on the, on the scale of the body, so quite small uh, scale. I think the biggest, uh, this is uh, machine made, the biggest <coughs> uh, diameter is 13 uh, uh, millimeters. So uh, it's a, a little bit more than a centimeter is what you can buy uh, from, a, for, um, from um, let's say, uh, a manufacturer. Um, this is too uh, small, obviously, for the building. So we started to test first uh, by just laser cutting um, different uh, dimensions uh, in our uh, office to see what is the right size and at the same time we started to see that uh, this material actually has, so what gives it these elastic uh, uh, qualities, we started to play with how it works uh, uh, geometrically, we uh, got a sample and we started to see how uh, sort of it behaves and we, there's sort of a directionality and we found out that there is a way in which uh, indeed this thing uh, stretches which allows for it to take on this double uh, curvature. So we mapped uh, the uh, entire uh, um, um, perimeter of the building and so where sort of its maximum expansion and its, uh, uh, its, its tightness, obviously the roof would be 100% and then we can sort of stretch it along uh, the rest uh, uh, of the circular area of the building. And by then we realized, okay, if we're really gonna do this, um, we have to uh, get an engineer uh, on board and we actually really have to figure this out because we have to, uh, uh, obviously this thing doesn't exist and how do you uh, come up with, uh, uh, well, it needed to get approvals and uh, uh, be um, survive earthquakes, uh, etc. So we teamed up with uh, Front uh, Facade Engineers. Uh, we asked them if they wanted to help us with this, um, and they said yes. We're going to do a, um, uh, we're going to work together on it. We're going to do a, a digital trajectory and a, and, a, and just a physical uh, uh, tra trajectory. And so we started to do some really super simple empirical testing by just seeing how do forces behave because there's actually very little uh, knowledge about this um, uh, material um, available. Um, and we started to see sort of initial uh, patterns of, of stress uh, and how they uh, behave. This model became more uh, complex to a level where we almost have every ring uh, uh, modeled. Um, and we built a large uh, mo uh, model in our office. This is a one to 10 scale uh, model uh, with the rings to actually see uh, how it would behave um, in, in, in its physical proportion. So it's really both, I think, that are important, both the, the physical and the, and the digital that, that need to work uh, together and it starts to um, well, in a way, uh, uh, prove that these things uh, can work to an extent. Um, by then we knew quite a bit about this material and we actually also had to think of how to install it. And uh, then um, we, together with Front, decided why don't we just actually uh, just fabricate the thing ourselves and deliver it and probably, you know, we're gonna be installing it as well because, you know, there's, it, it's, um, the, the, these are all things, aspects you need to think through. So where do you go? and uh, get this, you go to alibaba.com. Um, <laughs> people uh, who are not uh, familiar with alibaba.com, it's sort of the match.com uh, uh, between people that make things and people that uh, need things. And so once we put in an inquiry uh, at alibaba.com with ring mesh, we got a um, ton of uh, uh, factories in uh, China, actually through Skype, pretty much uh, approaching us. One um, Skype name was appropriately called uh, Ring. And um, so she, we, are, uh, we started to chat uh, with one of these people and they, we started to work with them and they actually provided us um, a large uh, uh, mock-up or a large uh, sample. This is, uh, I think, eight feet by uh, six feet or something. And um, it was a very promising uh, Skype relationship we started to develop and at some point, uh, same as uh, the people you meet at match.com, you have to see each other in real life. And so we decided to go to uh, 
um, China, uh, not, this was about, uh, well, a little bit over a half a year ago, um, to Anping, and Anping is six hours uh, west of uh, Beijing um, in a town where after uh, quite a, a, a sort of um, intense uh, car, <coughs> car ride, we, uh, we ended up uh, in this town. And uh, uh, it was a pretty rough town. You can buy uh, dogs. Uh, and um, we ended up in this very small courtyard, I would say as big as uh, the stage uh, here. And there was our sample. Um, and we, uh, we looked around. Uh, this woman had just uh, uh, eaten her food. And this is a, a little room off of this courtyard. And all the way in the back, there's one uh, uh, machine um, where even uh, behind that machine was one uh, boy. And uh, this boy was there uh, hand welding these uh, uh, rings uh, together. So um, we had guaranteed to our client that we would be able to deliver this uh, mesh. And uh, this was the moment sort of, of, uh, of realization um, of what we had uh, discussed. The man here on the left also realized that uh, when we told him that there were actually 400,000 rings that it would probably take him um, um, uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 10 years to put the facade together. <laughs> this is um, Mike. Let's say that we have a lot of cousins in town. Yeah. He, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, Jing, uh, who is uh, from China, also uh, acknowledged that she had never been so deep into China. So this was a very sort of uh, 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 chi deep China for the Chinese. Uh, Mike Ra from uh, Front there also thinking, gee, what did I, uh, what did I promise? Um, what we did is we took this sample and we actually went to another uh, company because uh, smartly uh, um, Jing had seen that most of the Skype uh, uh, reactions actually all came from this town, uh, Amping, and a more aggressive uh, 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 company. They, they took the sample and they said, we can do this. And uh, within um, uh, uh, 24 hours, uh, we found a, a number of companies that could do it. So Mike uh, was uh, happy again. And, um, we, uh, we, well, now at this moment, we actually, we just commissioned uh, 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 one of these companies, the other one, the one with the tiger is actually making the, the, the mesh now. Uh, so we could happily start uh, digging. And this was uh, just uh, uh, two weeks ago. Um, they finished all the uh, pouring of the concrete, the foundation, and um, the project should be uh, done in, uh, in November, uh, this project. And then we're going to continue to work on these other uh, projects on that uh, site. Um, yeah, you're going to do <laughs> next project. Yeah. So this next project um, is also, in, I mean, it's also in Asia. It's a, um, a 400 square meter exhibition um, space that's erected um, in the mid center of Beijing. Um, this is a, it's a newly uh, kind of built center that's mimicking the Rockefeller Center um, development. And uh, to um, so in this place, um, a culture festival is called the Get Louder. Um, that's led by um, the culture kind of curator um, Oling and uh, the architecture curator um, Eric Shen. Um, and they approached us two months before the um, opening of the um, festival, and they asked us maybe we can do a kind of exhibition and pavilion space for all the. Um, screening and uh, lecturing um, programs to take place during the festival. And we said, you know, because we never say no, we said yes <laughs> this time too. Um, so two days later, we got a uh, project schedule which indicated that we need to deliver the construction documents in the following week. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but we remained optimistic and uh, proposed uh, something very quick to them along the same similar um, thoughts that we had of this uh, um, unstable structure that we experimented in PS1 at that moment. Um, so our proposal was um, this uh, vertical structures that's connected only on one end rigidly and on the other kind of gathered with a tension ring. And this ring would be held down by, um, by uh, adjustable weights. And uh, so um, by manipulating the weights, you would get a different curvature of that vertical member, therefore the um, shifting, uh, the transforming um, form of the pavilion, the structure itself. And to keep the ring and the sun out, we would have just simply put a tarp um, on the upper portion of the pavilion and, uh, um, 
this tarp can just be changed from um, lo one location to the other because this uh, festival was supposed to take place in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Um, so they liked the idea very much, um, uh, but they said uh, in Beijing we have very strong wind, um, so we need to, um, the unstable structure is not going to work, um, but we will um, approximate your, um, your engineering um, solution with our engineer. And uh, um, this is the, our um, approximation, and uh, uh, this is the detail. Thank you very much. And uh, before we know it, it was erected. So, we <laughs> um, and the, the with so, and the next uh, question they had was, okay, about this skirt, we like it very much, but we need uh, also for the same wind reason, we need a little bit more substantial skirt. So this time we learned our lesson, and uh, immediately we proposed a um, solution that uh, would um, be, uh, you know, within two days we proposed a solution that would just hand this um, stainless steel um, panels to kind of the horizontal members that dispense um, on this uh, uh, vertical members, and they would be connected only loosely at the top. So when the wind comes, the supposedly very strong wind of Beijing comes, uh, it would uh, create this ripple effect um, on the skin of the window, uh, I mean of the building. So um, they said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Um, the only thing is that the um, stainless steel is too expensive. If we um, change them to plastic, and uh, make them thicker, they should be achieve the exact same effect. And uh, we found the uh, list colors that's available on the market. Uh, we think the three colors matches your stainless steel um, specifications, um, but please confirm. So um, we pondered for a few hours and uh, concluded that if the kind of subtlety that we intended to um, achieve with the stainless steel um, panels cannot be achieved, um, then maybe, you know, um, we should uh, go for alienness. Um, so we said, um, let's go with shocking pink because uh, the shocking pink has luckily um, quite a few variations with that family. Um, and because we thought um, subtlety and alien um, alienness are sort of the, the two ends of the same um, scale of the uh, two ends of the sliding scale of um, differentiations. So um, with this, uh, you know, three uh, shocking pink variations, we sort of got both. So um, by this time, when our um, on, you know, um, on the ground local staff told us that our um, uh, custom detail for the hinge was replaced by tie wrap. We were not so surprised, and uh, we were not so disappointed either. I think uh, we were actually uh, quite um, pleased that, um, by this point, that um, that uh, this tag of war relationship with the clients and the contractors um, there, and also the kind of the situation that no one can do anything about. Um, is uh, fascinating to us. Um, it's a new relationship that um, it's a new relationship uh, that's kind of constantly shifting and transforming, and uh, um, and maybe in this situation everyone is a winner and no one is. I um, think uh, we asked for a mock-up, but they sent us an invitation to the opening, and they said, "Why need a why need a mock-up? Because uh, we already built the." Yeah. <laughs> So with this invitation, I flew to Beijing and then looking at this uh, shocking pink uh, building um, in front of me and I was uh, wondering if we, we are the author of this design. Um, <laughs> however, um, and just go back to my point earlier that I think it's precisely um, from this kind of hybridized um, um, kind of a, a dynamic that this bastard typologies and uh, um, mutant materials are formed. And there's something interesting in that, that um, the architects will not be the person that holds the iron stamp, but rather we are the people who can um, negotiate between um, peop different peoples and different ideas and different places. And uh, um, maybe we can be the um, interface between the softer links. Um, 
into some new energy. And there's a short video of the effect of the steam on electrical components. Thank you. After the two months of adventure. They also calculated the parameters a little bit to a little bit, so the top of the pavilion was not covered. I never saw the thing actually because it went so fast that I didn't have a chance to uh, to go there. But it was um, so the video is the same. Uh, it's the most information. There, when but it was published in the magazine, there was a writer who said it's rare to see a sh pink shiny building so contextual. Hmm. So I think without the story, <laughs> maybe I can um, clarify why it was very contextual. Um, we're going to show now uh, two more projects. One is a, uh, a competition entry we just did. And um, we're showing this, I think, uh, um, more because of the uh, way we um, uh, did the, the project. So the, sort of from a process uh, standpoint, um, uh, we worked together with uh, Arab uh, acoustical engineers with whom we had uh, developed a relationship uh, through PS1. And so this is um, a competition in Poland. Um, in Warsaw for a, a symphony hall, 1,500 uh, uh, people symphony hall. And what is interesting in the in, in sort of the competition brief is that the architectural brief was like three pages and the acoustical brief is pretty much 50 pages. And so uh, the jury was also mostly uh, acousticians and it gave us, um, um, well, what was very interesting is that it immediate, fr first of all, it means that as a young uh, and small office, it actually allows you to participate in these Things because it the, the sort of the weight within such uh, a project um, can be uh, uh, shared uh, the, the 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 sort of the load the workload and also the, the uh, say the the ideas load that needs to be uh, 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 put into it um, and it's also really interesting to see how uh, indeed maybe the architectural practice is, is changing in a much more collaborative uh, spirit and so. Uh, th that's one reason to, to show it. Um, at the same time, I think uh, what is interesting is th the way we're trying to develop um, uh, a design method that keeps uh, options uh, open towards uh, the end. Let me first just explain a little bit about the project itself. This is the uh, token Google Earth uh, uh, picture um, <coughs> for when you can't go on a site visit. But this is in the east of uh, uh, Poland, uh, there's, or in, uh, in, sorry, in, in Warsaw. Uh, the less developed part, the historical part, is on the west side, and um, right uh, here you see a park and um, this old veterinary institute, which was uh, to be the site um, for this uh, competition. The veterinary institute had been there for a very long time, and so it was sort of an enclave uh, within the uh, city. Beautiful, uh, but uh, uh, inaccessible. Um, the, the idea was to um, uh, move the symphony um, hall uh, within this uh, enclave uh, and also bring in um, uh, rehearsal halls and educational uh, uh, parts uh, within a number of old uh, uh, buildings that were on the site, beautiful uh, sort of uh, uh, lush uh, uh, um area within the city. Um, and so, and, and to add this large uh, uh, concert hall. <coughs> and these buildings, they have, uh, uh, I mean they certainly ha had a certain capacity, but the 1500, uh, seat uh, concert hall is quite a large uh, hall to land uh, within uh, this site. Uh, the historic buildings were also already used for some uh, uh, local music uh, school. And so um, I will um, briefly explain the way we uh, came up with the form, which had to do in a way with how do you deal with, on the one hand, this very rigid uh, axis of the existing uh, buildings in this classical uh, uh, central symmetrical axis. At the same time, the ambition to uh, come up 
with um, a form that opens up the sites to a larger uh, audience and actually uh, uh, reaches out to an audience beyond um, uh, um, the, the site uh, itself. So we kept the, 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 the access, we kept the project on access, but actually through its form, we tried to uh, generate a space uh, that exists uh, beyond uh, uh, the site. Um, we were able to get all the uh, uh, auxiliary program uh, and, and facilities into the old uh, buildings and, and could make the, the concert hall itself as sort of an individual uh, room uh, in the back uh, of the site, which you see uh, over here. The form, um, in a way, uh, opens up towards the, uh, uh, towards the city, uh, allows daylight into the space, also into the concert hall itself, which is actually a, a quite exciting thing, and it also, in a way, tries to respect the space of the, um, of the old uh, buildings uh, around it. Um, so here you see, and it, and, and it was also, it was in a way a struggle to see how big uh, such space uh, uh, or such hole needs to, needs to uh, uh, be. So this is the overall uh, organization, um, what I, uh, 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 and its relation to the park and sort of the way we opened it um, up um, uh, um, by making the, uh, the entire perimeter uh, permeable. Um, and then the, the hall itself is actually quite uh, straightforward in the sense that you have uh, the concert hall, which needs to be an enclosed, uh, acoustically sealed space. And then you have the lobbies, the foyers um, that can happen between this interior skin and this, uh, this exterior um, skin. And then there's a large um, uh, rehearsal, concert, uh, uh, orchestra rehearsal hall uh, underneath, which uh, can be visible <coughs> from the yeah from the lobby and then there's a second lobby where people with tickets go and then they sort of move up through staircases in between this shell actually between the the inner wall of the hall and the outer wall of the of the uh, the form um, here you see uh, the the lobby and sort of the underbelly of the of the uh, hall as you move um, up and then for the hall uh, itself it was very Interesting, well, there's basically two uh, typologies of concert halls. One is the shoebox, which is sort of the deep, uh, classic uh, uh, Amsterdam uh, Concertgebouw, or uh, 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 the Vienna um, Music uh, Hall. Um, and then there is the, since obviously uh, Shahum, the, the, the much more uh, uh, dramatic and uh, uh, currently desirable uh, um, uh, vineyard setting, also the Disney uh, uh, Hall by Gary uh, uses this. And actually, uh, as there's sort of a shift to, from uh, listening to seeing, uh, people like uh, more dramatic halls where the sound is actually uh, uh, less great than the straight box where the acoustics are good, but maybe you can't show your new mink uh, coat. So we, uh, there was sort of a drive for um, uh, this um, uh, vineyard type uh, setting. And, we, um, and, and it means that there's a new sort of architectural project within the design of, that, uh, of the way people are organized within that space. And so, the, the vineyard is a very dramatic, uh, um, uh, uh, um, visually rich uh, um, uh, type, and so we were we went in, in search for an image uh, that could uh, that we could use uh, in a way to work uh, towards, or basically as a source of inspiration. This is a Esch, uh, Escher drawing, uh, obviously the mathematician who um, made um, complicated um, um, geometric uh, drawings, and <coughs> this became sort of a, a thing to chase within this design. And what was nice is that, so here really the dialogue between Arab um, and us was very, uh, it was a very collaborative uh, and actually back and forth type of method. So we had to come up with a, with a way of working in which we could refine uh, the acoustics at the same time, get this architectural idea in there. And the idea of this, um, say, Escherian uh, um, uh, construct was also the idea of making sort of a scaffold, like a network uh, that would sit loose as a, as an individual structure within this uh, acoustical uh, shell. So you have an acoustic shell, and then within it is sort of this um, really open, uh, um, uh, lace-like, um, more like mesh-like sort of uh, uh, um, independent uh, uh, structure uh, where people would sit and would allow for daylight even to come in uh, behind uh, 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 the seats and uh, people to circulate behind the seats. So we developed this concept um, um, which is the variable volume uh, where the, the acoustics of the hall can actually um, dramatically change depending on the volume that is made available. So this inner uh, seating structure could be closed off and uh, such that the volume of the hall could be um, uh, closed, uh, which gives you a, di a different reverberation time and then the entire space can open up 
um, for larger uh, orchestras. And so, uh, and the other part was sort of the acoustical pod where the, uh, the, the, so the sides of the um, uh, walls uh, behind the seating would reflect the sound back. So these were given by uh, Arab and we, we worked with them uh, very, very, um, uh, ah, and here we also, we didn't copy the movie to this uh, thing. This is also a movie which shows uh, basically uh, um, a parametric model that we um, came up with which allows, which allowed us to continuously uh, refine the shape uh, of the room and change it while uh, sticking to the parameters that were given um, by uh, Arab. And so actually we only had to fix the room in sort of the last uh, uh, minute, but at the same time could guarantee its acoustical uh, uh, performance. Uh, this is a physical model of that, of that lattice uh, structure that would be inserted in the acoustical uh, shell. And here some uh, imagery of how that would uh, look. And a view um, at uh, night. Uh, this one we also didn't win, and we will continue to do uh, more competitions until we win uh, one. Uh, and now Jing is going to show our first project. Yes, this is uh, um, our first project, also it's the last project of uh, um, tonight. Um, this is the project that uh, Mark referred to in the introduction. Um, in many ways, it was the first, um, it was the perfect first project because um, it made us to think some of the most fundamental um, issues within the architecture discipline. Um, it is a, um, you know, single family um, or more like for the older couple um, uh, holiday house um, sited on the Hudson, along the Hudson Valley um, in, the ups, uh, in the New York State. In Garrison. In Garrison. And uh, um, so the project is a, it's a week, weekend house and uh, it's for this uh, um, modernist graphic designer, Ivan Chemaya, who's also portrayed, um, who's in this picture. And uh, um, that's him. And these are some of the projects that he's done in his um, life. Um, <coughs> so he was, uh, um, if you uh, are not familiar with him, basically he um, cleaned up all the mess of the pre-modern um, uh, co corporate um, logos and uh, uh, fonts in America and uh, um, uh, worked in, continued to work in this modernist tradition um, to this day. And, uh, um, so um, w for us to work with him, it was an interesting dialogue um, between, our g uh, between him and us as a different generation. And uh, we proposed to um, challenge um, this conventional man looking over nature trope as um, often done in a modernist fashion. And uh, um, so do, um, we kind of uh, by dissolving and uh, distributing the mass of um, mass of the buildings into a loose gathering of the solid and the voids into the site. Um, we create a house that's equally open in all directions and uh, welcomes nature in. The common programs, uh, the living room, dining room, um, uh, library, bedrooms, and bathrooms are kind of uh, um, uh, they, they all have, each have their individual volumes and uh, they're all connected and separated from each other by this um, enclosed courtyard in the middle. There are two of them. One is here and one is over here. And so the pa it, this kind of configuration allow um, passive cooling to um, go through the building, which, um, and also we uh, um, had the trees um, we, we try to not cut the um, magnificent trees around the site and also have um, two in the courtyard and we used that as um, shading um, to um, avoid, to eliminate the active cooling systems. Uh, we'll be playing the film that Mark uh, referred to earlier, um, which will talk about the design in great detail, so I'm not going to explain it too much. But just to walk you through the space, um, this is a library, which is uh, one of the solid volume. And uh, this is the living room that's between, um, adjacent to the library. Um, that's in a glass volume, sort of the void um, that, I, um, that I mentioned earlier. And this is the living room looking at the other from the other side. This is the bathroom. 
um, that's also a void, which is a glass volume. So um, this can only be done if uh, you have a lot of forest around you. <laughs> and uh, so this is a um, yeah, this is the kind of uh, the collection <coughs> we um, of s solid and void, um, and inviting the nature in. So unfortunately, this uh, project did not um, uh, was cancelled right um, after the CD was completed. And after we got a building permit. Yeah, even after we got the building permit, but um, fortunately, we were able to capture some parts of the story with this short interview we um, produced with Ivan. Um, I miss the tower, don't you? I do. The, the, the greater uh, exaggeration of the heights, I think, was kind of important thing. I, I, I think essentially the brief is the flexibility of, of having uh, guests and, uh, and family fr uh, from time to time, but basically it's the two of us where I can make a mess and where Jane can make a mess because I like to do my own artwork and make collages and uh, even my studio doesn't require a lot of space because I don't do large paintings and I'm not chipping away at big stones with hammers and it, it, it but it's Again, part of the plan of the house is to have uh, what might be called studio and workplace for Jane, uh, separated from mine, uh, so that we're not interfering with each other every minute. Um, and where we uh, found this site, it, it, I would say it looked out if one um, could see through the trees in all directions, and probably um, more than 300 degrees out of 360. It was geologically very um, dramatic in the sense that its rocks, hills came up uh, um, in, in very quick succession. So it's very uh, three-dimensional um, uh, territory. It, this is a house, I think, that what I could say that grew out of the client and the and the site and the problem, because there are two spaces which are completely open to the sky, so that that means another kind of light, and uh, uh, but if you're in one or the other, you're looking through the real space, real in the sense of, of dirt and sky to the other space so that there's a sense of enlargement of what you do have because of this mixture of indoor, outdoor, open, closed yeah. mix. Exactly. And that's very important. And most houses don't work like that. No. You know, most part the houses, you go from one room to another, and the, all you can do is see back through the doorway to what you just left, but not a sense of space, usually. We're talking about moving a rock, that the only way you could get it there would be before the house and the walls go up, otherwise it would weigh too much. I mean, it's five tons of boulder. 10,000 pound boulder, I mean, as big as this table and that high, you know, that's a, a real stone. It's a matter of bringing the inside outside even more. I, I noticed, though, that you don't have it in the yeah, rendering. The rendering uh, we were. But, but it's a, uh, I think you should have put it in the model, too, because I think it's kind of important. We have it in the, in the large model, it, 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 it is. You've got a rock in there? Yes. Because so, I think it makes a difference. Uh, having been brought up uh, in in uh, in a very modern 
contemporary world with, with in, in every way with uh, not only a father a brother a son who are architects uh, the only reason I'm not an architect is because I don't have the patience to wait for things uh, to happen I'm, I'm a graphic design I do a hundred times more jobs than 95 percent of mine are done my father was born in in, in, in the Caucasus and was uh, uh, the, the land that his family had was breeding and raising horses and they had thousands, thousands of acres. It was an incredible uh, long thing. But they, when they discovered oil on their lands, which didn't really affect the, what they did that much, but it made them rich as Croesus. Uh, but 1917, he went from being a rich young man to penniless. Bolsheviks took away everything. He didn't have anything more than the clothes on his back, more or less. Nothing. He was on his own from 17 years of age on. That was the, that. Was that. So he was, uh, uh, as he always said, he was saved by having everything taken away. Because otherwise he would, you know, would be in pantaloons, you know, and a snotty pain in the ass. <laughs> but, but so he became an architect, yes. an educator in, in great universities, Harvard, Yale, MIT, Institute of Design. He, 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 he was a very important uh, teacher to an awful lot of architects. He never studied architecture in his life. Never went to architectural no. school, not for 10 minutes. He decided to be an architect, period, and did it. The, the idea of, uh, of the problems of architecture was something that I always uh, had a sort of uh, instinctive fear about. <laughs> because um, uh, so many things start and don't get done. Uh, and for, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. Uh, I'm not as uh, well off as I would hope to be after working hard for 50, 60 years. Because <laughs> otherwise I'd be glad to build it and make it bigger. <laughs> I think if you were boxes, uh, you know, but, but I, 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 I uh, realize that not only that, but at my age, my income is going to go down even if I survive. You know, that's guaranteed. It's not guaranteed that I'll survive at all, but it's guaranteed that if I do, that I won't be richer. <laughs> guaranteed. Not possible. Okay. Well, this is a nice sight, but um, which I still own. Yeah. Someday you will build a house. Maybe they'll build this house. I think this is too uh, too personal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's also it's as you said, the architecture architecture is very different from graphic design. You have to. It, it doesn't always happen. Yeah, but. Um, it's too bad because I think it, you know if 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 I and, and just uh, could afford it, it, it could have been expanded, and uh, and I would love to have it for not just for because it's good, but but. on such a sad note, but uh, <laughs> this is the end of our lecture, so thank you. <laughs>
very plump and slender, like Mr. Smalley. Yes, thank you. Very plump and slender, Mr. Smalley. Anybody have tissues? Yeah. Did you look into Judge Chermayeff's archives while you were doing research for that project? No, we did not. But no, no, we did not. No, we spoke a lot with with Ivan himself, of course. We cut out one part of the video, which you can find on our site or elsewhere. I mean, basically, we reduced it further and further down. But at some point, he speaks about his relationship to Breuer and the impact Breuer Holmes had on him. He says that he used to pick Breuer's apples. So there was more of a sort of a Breuer reference there than than looking at his his father. Yeah. I hope not. 